Okay, Boker Tov, everybody. Nice to see everybody. Everybody's doing well and uh, not working too hard before Pesach. Uh, you should be enjoying Pesach, learning about Pesach, cleaning. Bito Chametz does 90% of the cleaning. Okay, a little bit here and there. All right. Um, um, thank you. So I don't know who, who was here at my shear last year and who remembers what I said. So I looked over my notes and uh, ho hopefully I'm going to try to say things I did not say at all last year. If any, if I repeat anything I said, please let me know. And then I'll give you a big yes koach for remembering and uh, we can move on that way. But okay. Okay, so I'm going to really start from Halachmania. We're going to go through Haggad and however far we get. And I know, well, we, you know, I'll pick up new ideas, hopefully, or things we haven't discussed in the past. And, um, um, and this, of course, you know, let me know if you have any questions. I think there, there's so much fascinating stuff in the Haggad. It's such a rich book. And uh, I think there are probably more commentaries on the Haggad than any other book. And I think more than the Chumash, it's a, a beloved book. People love the Haggadah. We know how widely observed the Pesach Seder is Jews who are very far removed from, from Judaism. Baruch Hashem, they still, uh, uh, um, you know, come to a Pesach Seder. I just saw this week that, I, what was it? 75% of Israelis don't eat chametz, including 39% of avowedly secular Jews. The Masorati movement, those who are traditional, 92% of them don't eat chametz. And even Jews who say, I'm totally secular, 39% of them don't touch any chametz for a week. So I think that's a beautiful thing. It means there's room for the other 61%, but okay, that's if you're a totally secular Jew, well, why shouldn't you eat chametz on Pesach? Bar Hashem. Okay, so let's begin. Halach manya. This is the, I, everybody can have a Haggadah. We're not going to do so much inside, inside, but uh, it's not a bad idea to have a Haggadah with you. Um, halach manya, this is the bread we ate in Egypt. Okay, when do we eat that bread in Egypt? Anybody? Halach manya, the night before we left. So, ah, uh, I'm sorry? Night before we left. Ah, uh, very good. So I thought people are going to say we ate it as slaves. I mean, that's all right. Slaves eat matzah. Matzah is a great slave food. Uh, it's easy to make, it's filling, it's cheap, it, it caves over. There's no indication, I, that, that may be very true, that the Jews ate, chame, ate matzah as slaves, but the Torah never tells us that. What the Torah does tell us they ate was fish and leeks and cucumbers, because whenever the Jews were in the desert and they didn't like it, they said, we want to go back to Egypt. You know that place where it had free fish and free cu cucumbers and melons? You know, that's, uh, so that we, and the Mephorshim assumed they were not lying, you know? Um, so what, oh, what happened? Why did my video go off? So, um, um, so the Torah never tells us they ate matzah in Egypt. Whether they did or they don't, I don't know. Um, it does tell us they ate matzah when they left Egypt. Now, I want to spend a few minutes talking about a, a, a problem, a well-known problem, but uh, the problem of um, the command to eat matzah. So what, what the, the command to eat matzah, which is the second most important mitzvah on Pesach, the first most important mitzvah we can't do anymore, the Korban Pesach. How do I know the Korban Pesach is more important than eating matzah? How, how, how do you know in theory the Quran Pesach is more important than Ima? How, how do you know if, if it's a negative commandment? It's easy to know. If it has Easter karate, if excision, you know that's more important So than something that doesn't. So eating chametz is an Easter karate. You're cut off from the people. Uh, eating pork is just a regular negative commandment. So it's much more important not to eat chametz than not to eat pork. And the, would you believe me, uh, and more than 39% of secular Jews, whatever, 61, whatever it is, eat pork because. Uh, that's what it is. Baruch Hashem, people, even if they don't know it, it's in our, our Jewish DNA that eating chametz is much worse. So how do I know in a positive commandment? How, how in the world do I know that eating the Korban Pesach is more important than eating eating matzah? So if you don't know, if you just look, look at, at, uh, at chapter 12 in Shemot, which we'll take a look at in a moment, which is the sort of beginning of the Exodus story. After the nine plagues, they're about to leave. Chapter 12, where Rashi says the Torah should begin. Um, God commands us to um, set up a, a calendar, and he tells us we're going to be leaving in, in two weeks. So it says, you have to eat the Korban Pesach, and he says you have to eat it with matzah and, and maror. It's pretty clear reading the verses that the main thing you're eating is the Paschal lamb, which makes sense. Uh, meat is much more, uh, meat, meat, you have a meal. So you have matzah or bread, whatever you have, and lamb chops. Obviously, the lamb chops is me. You, you, you go to a restaurant. What did you order? You're not going to say I ordered bread. I ordered lamb chops. So, and the Torah says, "Al matzotim ororim yochlu." You got to eat the meat. You got to eat it with matzah more. So that already tells you the korban pesach is more important. It also tells you, and we also know from that's not right here that the only two positive mitzvot in the Torah that if you don't do 
have have karet. It's very sort of strange. Usually karet, you do you eat on Yom Kippur, eat chametz on Pesach. That's isur karet. You're cut off from the people. So there are 36 karets in the Torah. 34 are negative commandments. Two are positive, and the two of that are positive. Like if you don't do them, that's the question when, uh, but whatever. But you don't do them. Um, you get karet. So one's a brit milah, and one's a korban pesach, and we know those two are related because the Torah says a male who doesn't have a brit milah cannot eat from the korban pesach, and of course they're they're thematically related. The brit milah is the personal covenant between God and the Jewish people, and the korban pesach is the communal covenant between God and and the Jewish people. These are flip sides of the same coin, and therefore you can't have one without the other. Without a brit, you can't have the 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 Korban Pesach. So the matzah is the second most important mitzvah. Okay, I don't know, maybe maybe Sipri Tzid Mitzrayim is more important, but okay, in terms of eating. Now, the command to give matzah was, uh, as I'm sure most people are at least a little bit familiar with, the command to eat matzah was given two weeks in advance, right? Rabbi Liftak touched upon that a little bit on the Rosh Chodesh Nisan, God speaks to Moshe and Aaron, he tells him, make this Rosh Chodesh Nisan. This is the first month of the year. And in 10 days, I want you to take the um a sheep and you're going to slaughter it for you're going to keep it for four days that's we know halakhali in, in the beta mikdash whenever they brought a, a, a korban they had to watch it for four days to look for any defects anyways then on the 14th in the afternoon you're going to slaughter it you're going to put the blood on the doorpost you're going to eat at night and you're going to eat with matzah and maror as we just said and for seven days every year for the rest of Jewish history, Jewish people are going to eat matzah for seven days. So we knew we knew we were leaving in advance. We knew what we were doing. So wh why was the command to eat matzah given then? So many people say, well, it's foretelling the future. The Torah is written out of order, and or the Torah knew it's just because we left. Okay, the, the Torah wrote it here. Why is that answer? There are two reasons that answer is not fully satisfactory. Anybody want to tell me why I think that answer is not fully satisfactory in my humble opinion? Well, it's so number one, I think, oh. is chapter 13 in Shmot. Uh, where do we have chapter 13? Let me go here. Does everybody see this? Okay. So chapter 13 in Shmot has the following, also has a bunch of laws. Kadesh di Kobachor, whatever, the firstborn. And it says um, a stranger can't eat. Um, where is it here? Um, that it's maybe it's the end of chapter twelve, right? Oh, ki aguri chager that a a um, a stranger can't eat with you, a convert can't eat with you unless he has a, a brit milah that we just pointed out. Torah shem achav. It talks about a toshav and and a sachir, a resident can't eat. It's got a your slave can't eat. All these people who can't eat, a ben nechar, a non Jew can't eat. Why is the Torah telling us this? You know why it's telling us this? Because it told us. Five verses earlier, Gam of Allah Imahem, that a, a multitude of non-Jews, the Egyptians, hey, we're going to be on the winning team. We're going to leave with the Jewish people. So they left. So after they um after we have an air of the Torah has to tell us, don't allow non-Jews to eat the Quran Pesa. Why didn't Torah tell us that in chapter 12? They waited till after the fact to tell us that. So it should wait till after the fact that we ate matzah to tell us that. Okay, maybe that's what I think. Okay, that's a little technical how the Torah is. More importantly, even if it's true, even if it's true that the Torah, yes, it's foretelling the future. And really the only reason we're eating matzah is because we left in a hurry. Just the Torah writes it earlier, but still the fact that the Torah writes it earlier is very important. We know it's how the Torah writes something. The Torah chose to specifically detach the mitzvah to eat matzah from the leaving Egypt in a hurry. Um, and the question is uh, why that happened. So I'm, I'm gonna suggest three three reasons why that happened, but if anybody wants to, but in other words, my claim is that the mitzvah to eat matzah, at least one part of the mitzvah, we'll see, is totally independent from the mitzvah, from the fact that we left Egypt in a hurry. Even had we not left Egypt in a hurry, we would have to eat matzah for seven days because the Torah separates the command to eat matzah from leaving. Why, though? What would be the reasons to eat matzah independently of leaving Egypt in a hurry? You'll have to ask something, well, say something. You know, Egyptians were the ones who created leavened bread. Yeah, 
So that we've discussed in other Shurim and Pashurim. The Egyptians were the ones who created leavened bread. Yeah, if you looked in Wikipedia or anywhere, the, the history of bread, I always like, I'll just, I'll, I'll show it to you because it, it's so powerful. We've seen this verse before, I think, but it, just to see it, you know, to see it with your own eyes, it's unbelievable. The brothers come down to Egypt and Yosef is, uh, is uh, you know, he's uh, emotionally um, taken over. It's it right here. Um, where is it? Yeah, they come, they come down Yosef here. I'm sorry, it's a little bit earlier. Uh, by Yar Yosef at Binyamin, he sees Binyamin, he gets, gets ready for a meal, and um, they bring him down. Hold on, is this it? Why can't they find it? Um, give me one second. Oh, here it is. Okay. He wanted to cry. Yosef is overtaken by emotion. You know, he sees his younger brother and he cries. If you take the idea that Natty Helfgott, Rabbi Helfgott suggested a few months ago when he gave a shear that it's, even though it doesn't seem the simple meaning that it's possible Binyamin was born after Yosef went to Egypt, and in which case he's never seen Binyamin in his life. That's a wild idea, but if you take that, it's even more powerful. Anyways, he went to cry, and then he came out, and uh, then he separated them. They have their meal with separate seating, but not men and women. It was Egyptians and Hebrews, because the, bread, the Egyptian will not eat bread, lechem, imayvrim, kitoiva, hilimitzrayim. It's a, an abomination for Egyptians to eat bread with Jews. In Hebrews, because bread is a special Egyptian delicacy. We made it, we don't eat it with foreigners. It's our food, and therefore the Torah, in separating us from Egypt, <clears throat> wants to tell us we can't eat any chametz. That's number one. Number two, why else is an important thing, matzah, unrelated to leaving quickly? Isn't there so, a famous base Halevi on this? I don't know. I think he's, he doesn't really explain why, because that doesn't matter to the briskas, but I think he says that the, in the um, mitzvah of eating matzah came first, and therefore all the events that happened were just in order for us to eat the matzah. But we don't really understand why That's, we need okay, to eat Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll address that a little later. Yeah, I, I know what you're referring to. Some, maybe we can address yeah. that a little later. I, okay, I'm going to say reason number two, which I like, of course, it's everything about Egypt and everything about the, the Torah. Um, the, the overarching um, message of the Torah is to be nice to other people. To love your neighbor as yourself, Rabbi Kiva is the most important verse in the Torah. But we know, or the Talmud says 36 times, the Torah says, be nice to strangers over and over and over and over again, because we were strangers in the land of Egypt. Or as I like to translate, the word key, you know, the word key in biblical Hebrew has at least four meanings. If, when, but, despite, right? And, uh, but, uh, so key. So key doesn't mean just because, it means despite, also in some context. So I think sometimes treat strangers nicely, key gerim despite the fact that you yourself suffered a slavery. We know when the, med the medical doctors, you know, when the guy's doing a residency, it explains it's inhumane to work 24 or 36 hours straight. So the the the, the, the chief, uh, the, you know, doctor says, what do you want? I did the same thing. It was worse when we did it. When we went to medical school, we had to work 36 hours. Now you guys don't have to work 24 hours. Don't complain. This, so this that's exactly what the Torah is saying. You, you, what, why should, we went through it. Other people can also suffer. It's not so bad. We grew from our experience. We became better. You can suffer. That's exactly what the Torah says. Do not dare say that. It's not just because you were slaves, despite the fact that you were slaves. So you may be more um, open to, you know, let slaves, let, let other people suffer a little bit and grow from their experience. No, you cannot do that. So that's the overarching message, of course, perhaps of the entire Torah. And that's, of course, we begin the Seder, Halachmania, we're, we're inviting guests, whether or not you can invite them now, it's symbolic, whether they used to say this, probably the origins of Halachmania, which are in Babylon, because it's in Aramaic, they used to probably say it in Shul, they used to do it before Pesach, but the idea is that we should know the most important thing is to be sensitive to the poor. And that's why you open up a Shulchan Aruch and Hilchat Pesach. Uh, the first thing they talk about is Ma'ot Chitim. You have to give money to the poor. Pesach's an expensive holiday. I'm sure most people know the famous story of Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, where the poor woman comes to ask her, it says, I don't have enough money. Can I make wine? Can I make uh, Kiddush on the fourth? 
four cups of milk. And Rav Chaim gives her 100 rubles, and the students say, what 100 rubles? Wine is only 10 rubles. He says, no, if the woman doesn't have money for for wine, if she wants to drink milk at the Seder, she doesn't obviously doesn't have any money to buy meat. So I gave her money to buy meat. That's the greatness of Rav Chaim. Not just that he was sharp, that his his kindness. That's a famous story. So that's the whole point of, the, of, of Pesach, and that's the whole point of the Torah. And therefore, at the fanciest meal of the year, four cups of wine, we eat this lousy wafer that nobody in their right mind would ever want to eat. It's so bad that the Torah, to, the Torah that we have a law, you're not allowed to eat eat chametz, uh, eat matzah on Arab Pesach. Because if you eat matzah on Arab Pesach, you may not like it at the Seder. Some people, I think, have a minag already at Purim, not to eat any matzah, because at least I haven't had it for a whole year. So, okay, so I don't mind eating it on the first night. It, it tastes half decent. But if I've eaten it for lunch on, uh, on Wednesday afternoon, by the night, I don't like it anymore. So, uh, so matzah reminds us of what lousy food is like what slaves eat that's uh, going back to what slaves eat and it develops our sensitivity to the poor the fanciest meal of the year we have to like put on the seder plate like in your face you're going to eat this food be sensitive to the poor it's kind of like i always like to say the the real reason or, or not the real reason like the most important reason we fast on yom kippur is to give charity to if if you've never been hungry you don't know what it's like to be hungry we have to experience hunger that's what the gemara says agra de tanita Staka, the reward for a fast day is charity because you dev- you understand how how painful it is, how terrible it is. And we know that in six hours we can eat. So that's why, that's the other reason matzah. Nothing to do with leaving in a hurry. Matzah reminds us to be sensitive to the poor. Halach mania, let's help. That's number two. Number three, which okay, those two reasons I think are, you know, whatever, are, are pretty obvious. The third reason, which in many ways is probably the most um the one the Torah directly speaks about the most, of course, hinting to, um, but it's really perhaps uh, quite powerful, is uh, what we read last week in Shul and what you're going to read this week in Shul. And you're going to read that um, when you bring a sacrifice in the temple, the Korban Mincha, we had the vegetarian sacrifice, you weren't allowed to have any chametz in the Korban Mincha. You weren't allowed to have any chametz. And Torah reiterates that. Um, last, I said, it's in Vayikra and it's in Sav. You're not allowed to have here. I'll show you the verse just so you know you can uh, see with your own eyes. Um, well, I I'll, I think I have the verse from last week up on the Vayikra uh, two. Here we go. Do not make your sacrifice to God in chametz. He calls soor again, like leaven or uh, or or dvash honey. You're not allowed to bring as a sacrifice to God. That's what the Torah tells us. So the question is, why? So so before we get to why, so Pesach is our korban. It's the first korban we brought, the first korban seabor, the first communal, quote-unquote, sacrifice that Jewish people brought was the korban Pesach. This is when we became a nation to God, and this is when the word korban, of course, doesn't really mean a sacrifice. It means to come close, to come close to God and to come close to man. I think somebody spoke about that recently. I don't remember. Maybe it was me in a cloud. I don't remember already. But a, a korban is to come close to God, that, but it's also to come close to man. That's what the, the prophets rail at. You're going to, I don't want your sacrifice if you're not going to uh, help the poor and you're not going to take, take care of the widow and you're not going to clothe the naked. Don't give me your sacrifices. It's, uh, I hate them. That's what God says through Yeshayahu. So, um, so the, the the korban is a way to come close to God and come close to man. No, that's exactly what the korban Pesach is. We have to invite all our neighbors. We have to come together as a family. We together, we join together in the temple. We came, we became one nation. That's what we became. So this is the highest korban we had. So if obviously, if in the korban not, you cannot have any chametz. So obviously, on Pesach, you're not going to have, um, you're not going to have the uh, um, any chametz with the Korban Pesach. And you realize whenever they brought, not always, but most of the time when you brought a Korban, you brought me Korban, they had to bring it with bread, i.e. matzah. In other words, all Korbanot were brought with wine and with bread. Hey, that's exactly what we do on Pesach. We have the matzah. I said, you eat it with the matzah. The main thing is the Korban. 
and you have bread for depending on what it is. Uh, you have to bring, like, you know, isaron ushlosha sronim shnei sronim isaron achid isaron are measures how much they have to bring. But you always had to bring bread, i.e., matzah. The bread couldn't be chametz. Bread is a generic term. So that's exactly what we do with the korban pesach. We're replicating a korban, and you have, to have wine libations. So we have four cups of wine. That's exactly what we do at the seder. So our korban pesach. When we eat, the, that's the matzahs with the Korban Pesach. Okay, we're missing the Korban Pesach. We still have the the, the matzah. By the way, there were views that matzah day is only a, 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 um, a rabbinic command. By the way, there were views that maybe matzah, because there's no Korban, what do you mean, without a Korban Pesach, what's matzah? It loses its much of its meaning. Just like Maror today, we assume is rabbinic. We do for, because there's an extra verse in the Torah that you have to eat matzah. No, matzah is also a biblical command, but it's not the same matzah. It's got to be, matzah is on a higher level when it's with the Korban Pesach. So the same way, Korbanot can't have chametz, so too the Korban Pesach, cannot have chametz, that's when we are coming close to God. Now, why, now let's ask the early question, what's so terrible if a korban has chametz? I want to offer a, a sacrifice to God. I want to come close to God. I want to come close to my, my fellow human being. So why shouldn't I have delicious bread? Why do I have to have matzah at, and a korban? In other words, that's very nice because the korban can't have, have chametz. The, the, uh, we can't have chametz on Pesach, but why can't the korban have any chametz? Maybe I think it represents Gaiva. Okay, so that's what right. a lot of people say. That's the symbolism of Chametz. Uh, I think the Sefer Achinuch, if I'm not mistaken, writes this also that um, that um, bread is rises. It's arrogant. It's uh, you know, it's uh, matzah is nice and humble, nice and flat. Okay, and we have to be humble. Good. It's also simple. It's also simple. Um, and I think there's something, and I, I say this as somebody who doesn't really subscribe to this in a sense, but like uh, what we call like um, emuna pshuta, simple faith. You know, I remember years ago when I was in the Gris Kolo, Rabbi Rakepet. Um, so uh, he taught us there. I'm sure many of you know of Aaron Rakepet. He's uh, quite an interesting, interesting person. And so he, um, remember he developed a course. I think the first year he was teaching a, a michlala back in, in the 70s. He saw a lot of the girls had questions and stuff. So he told everybody, write down your, you know, questions of faith, you know, people that often they were afraid. And he developed a whole course and about, you know, real difficult questions. And and uh, I remember he, he, he told us, this is not for, I, I just, you know, part of the sort of way, you know, he, he phrased it, the generalization, it's not for a nice space Yaakov girl. A nice space Yaakov girl who has nice amuna, just believes in God, everything. That's very nice. You don't want to raise too many questions because it can harm their faith. But for somebody like me, I my faith would be harmed if I had a simplistic approach to faith. I need the complexity of faith. Whatever, for better or for worse, that's how I was raised. I live in the modern world. That's what I think that's what it means to be modern Orthodox. And not good or bad. It just that's the reality of life. But there is something to be said for what we call emunapshuta, just pure faith. Don't ask too many questions. You know, don't philosophize too much. Um, so I think that is symbolized by the matzah also. It's very simple. It's very humble. We can interpret simple in a different way. Modest, right? Well, that's, I guess, the same as humble, very modest. The The other way, I what the Sefer Achinuk mainly speaks about, and I think this is the beautiful explanation, the one I like the best, is um, matzah has to be done quickly, and you have to worship God quickness. You cannot relax. We're always got to be on the run. And, and we got to work very, very quickly in our service to God. And uh, the best example of that, of course, I always, the most powerful example, I think we'll show to you, uh, the source is Yaakov Avinu, right? And then we'll tie in Yaakov to talk, lots of talk about Yaakov in Egypt. So what does the Rashi say? Okay, you know, Yaakov had a very difficult life. Uh, he says so himself. When Paro, right, when Paro asks Yaakov, um, what's the first thing Paro says to Yaakov when he meets him? How old are you? How old are you? Isn't that a little bit of a strange question? You're going to meet the president of the United States. And you go, and you walk into Joe Biden's office. He says, uh, "Hello, how old are you?" That's ridiculous. Maybe he looked very old. Ah, he, he looked so clearly. Clearly, there was something about Yaakov that Yosef's father, the viceroy, the person who saved Egypt, his father's coming down. This is his father. Wow, he looks like so. There's something wrong. What are you? 195 years old, and that's why you look like this. 
So Yaakov said, no, 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 no. Uh, you understand, I'm not so old. I'm only 130. I mean, whatever. I'm, uh, I'm only 130. I've had a really hard life. You know, Every, you know I, I've had this really awful life. And ma'at uh, v'ra'im, that's what he says, right? Few and bad. I've had a bad life. And the Medrash quotes, I think the Chizkuni brings down, Gaga really angry at Yaakov. Ah, chutzpah. You know, after everything I'm saving, now you're reuniting with Yosef, and I saved you from this and from Asab and this, and you're rich, and, and you're complaining. So the Medrash says there are 33 words in that exchange between Yaakov and Paro. And for every word, he lost a year of his life. So Yaakov only lived to be 147 years old, not 180, like, uh, like I'm sorry, Yitzchak. Avram also should have lived to be 180, but the Medra says that's when Asaph went through a bad path at 175. So he was lucky to see that, you know, he didn't, Avram didn't have to see his grandchildren going off the path. So he died at 175, God did him a, a, a favor. But the Yaakov, so it's an unbelievable idea. So uh, it's really powerful. So Yaakov, you know, Yaakov finally thinks before the saga with Yosef, before that's really what probably you're saying. This, uh, 22 years, he's been going terrible. I mean, I, I understand what Yaakov, where Yaakov is, is coming from. I get it. I understand why he would look. What he went through is hard. So you have to understand why this guy gets so angry at him, but for another time. And Yaakov is living, and as, um, he's uh, he's left Lavan. It's, uh, and now it's finally Baruch Hashem. He's home, and uh, he can relax. He's 108 years old. He's got a long life ahead of him. He's had just over, you know, he's not so old in biblical time. And yeah, so Rashi quotes a famous, powerful, powerful means Rush of Soloveitchik quoted all the time. Bikesh Yaakov Leshev Beshalva. Vayeshev. Yaakov wanted to sit quietly, relax, like Ben Gurion in the Negev. I'm going to live out my last years in peace. Kafatz Aleha Rogzoshal Yosef. The anger of Yosef, so to speak, jumped upon him. Sadikim Mevakshim Leshev Beshalva. The righteous people want to sit in peace. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God said, Lo lama ba. It's not enough. What you're going to get in the world come? You want this world too? You, you think you've had problems now? No relaxing. And the next verse, Yosef, now, now, now everything up to now was basically child's play. Now your real troubles are, are going to start. So that's a powerful idea. A Jew cannot relax. And it's also, we don't like that. I, I think I mentioned many years ago, once uh, there was an, I have to find it, many, many years ago, somebody in tradition, you know, you read all articles in, in tradition. I just recently read the article from 1976, Gary Epstein. I, I, I haven't referred to the article, but I haven't read it in 40 years. But um, Gary Epstein, I, I don't, I have no idea who he is. He was, uh, I don't know if he is still alive. He was a professor of English at the University of, Iowa, I believe, and he wrote an article in tradition. I've mentioned this article. What would God forbid happen if Israel would cease to exist? And he wrote a whole analysis. Well, what would happen? What would reform Jews and the Orthodox would have a fast day? He says it was after the Yom Kippur War. Nobody likes to talk about these things, but we're idiots if we don't talk about it. It could happen, and uh, and therefore we have to, you know, worry about these things. And and he wrote an article, very, you know, uh, whatever. And I mentioned the the editors got lambasted. How the chutzpah! How dare you publish this? They were like furious, furious for, for tradition publishing. So unfortunately, with what's going on now, I decided to reread the article recently. So you have uh, fascinating articles in in, in tradition going back uh, many many years. So uh, I remember many years ago, somebody wrote in tradition going a, a rabbi wrote going on Club Med. Does Club Med still exist? I have no idea. I, I haven't heard about it for, for 30 years, right? You know what Club Med is? Everybody know what Club Med is? I, 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 right. So that's some fancy, I don't know, all expense vacation. I don't even know what it is exactly, but it probably not something a yeshiva boy does very much. So uh, so he wrote a whole article about relaxation and clubs. And Rabbi, Nita, we need vacation. We need, I, I mean, Yaakov, that's an extreme, but the idea that a Jew cannot... Um, a Jew has to always be on the move, has to act quickly. And that's matzah. And that's when we eat matzah. So this has nothing to do with leaving Egypt. I mean, I guess we left in a hurry too, but this is independent. This is our service of God. So there's basically God, Egypt, right? And uh, and coming close to other, other people that we eat matzah to the poor, 
to be concerned with the poor, to separate from Egypt, the bread-making capital of the world, and to come close to God and our fellow human beings. <laughs> Those three reasons, independent from leaving in a hurry. Now, I just want to spend uh, a few minutes. I was going to leave it till later, but I think I'll hope you... We'll talk about Yaakov. So, um, you know, we have a big problem... Uh, Big problem, you know. Seoman Mabikesh Lavan Army Lesot Yaakov Avinu. So, why in the world does the Haggadah start with Yaakov? So that's so Marty Lakshin yesterday, uh, two days ago, whenever he gave a wonderful shear, talked about what Arami Oved Avi means, and is it a wandering Aramean was my father, meaning Yaakov, or the way the Haggadah? Why does Haggadah do it? Says an, an Aramean sought to destroy my father. Be that as it may, um, what he didn't really talk about, but David Eisen, I think, put a little note in the chat box that um, the story of Yaakov is really the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. I just want to go over very quickly some of the parallels that really Yaakov is the mini story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. So um, Yaakov, and this, you know, the Haggadah clearly is linking Yaakov and, and, and Lavan in Egypt. Lavan's even worse, but because Arami Ove Davi, an Aramean sought to destroy my father. Lavan tried to kill my father. By Yered meets Rima. He went to Egypt right away. That's ridiculous. Wait, we went to Egypt right away. And it's it's immediate in the verse. He went to Egypt 80 years later, and whatever, 50 years later. It, it went, what are you talking about? There he went home, he went back to Shem. He goes back home. He's sitting it's many, many years. There's no connection between Lavan. So many people say, what do people say? Well, if Lavan wouldn't have tricked him. Um, and given him, um, if he would have married Rachel instead of Leah, as he was promised, I don't know, um, then he would not have had the problems with Yosef and the brothers. It's very nice, a little stretched, you know, If, uh, but I can say, you know, if Yaakov wouldn't have stolen the birthright from his father, his brother, he wouldn't have had to run to Lavan. Like, you, you know, you can't do that. Like, if, you know, if this would have happened, there are 85 things that happened in advance. The way the, the Torah presents it is... Lavan tried to destroy him, and he went down to Egypt. Is that exactly true? So why does the Haggadah do this? I think because the Haggadah understood that Yaakov and Lavan's house was Egypt. That was Egypt. So let's quickly go over, unless you want to tell me, let's let's quickly go over like six or seven parallels between the story of Yaakov and the story of Egypt, which makes, of course, a lot of sense, because Yaakov is B'nai Yisrael. Yaakov, so what, whatever happens to Yaakov, sort of this idea the Ramban develops, not in this context, Masea Votsiman Lebani, what happens to the, the patriarch, and matriarch is a sign what will happen to their descendants. But Yaakov is literally Yisrael. He becomes Yisrael. So what happens to Yaakov is exactly what's going to happen to B'nai Yisrael, his children, his descendants. Number one, he has to flee home. Like, uh, right? And why does he have to flee home? Because he's fighting with his brother. Why do the Jewish people go down to Egypt? Because they're fighting with Yosef. The brothers are fighting. So they, you have to flee from the land of Israel because you're fighting. That's, I mean, that's how it starts. They're welcome with open arms. Lavan, oh, Achi, you're my brother. Come in. Uh, you know, I'll give you everything you want. And that's exactly what Paro did. The Jew, you know, we'll give whatever land you want. Go to Goshen. You know, beautiful. We and uh, the Jewish people. That's what we say. That's why we eat romaine lettuce for Mara because it tastes good and only afterwards is bitter. Or whatever. Right. Our initial stay in Egypt was very, very pleasant. Very, very beautiful. Only afterwards it becomes bitter. Um, then Lavan tricks Yaakov, of course, um, with deceit, you know, a whole uh, thing. What does Par say? Let's deal wisely. Let's think of finagle. You can't just turn, Yosef saved Egypt. What are you going to do? Enslave his grandchildren? You can't do that. They had to devise a devious plan. Oh, maybe the Jews will volunteer to build a city. And before they know it, they'll be working so hard, they'll be slaves without even realizing it, right? We'll give them taxes. You know, you slowly raise the taxes. So that's exactly with deceit. No, despite all this, what happens? Yeah, yeah, in Lavan's house, Yaakov has a big family. That's 12 children in Lavan's house, right? Everybody except Binyamin is born while he's in Lavan's presence. The Jewish people multiplied. When does Yaakov leave? When does Yaakov leave Lavan? When does God tell Yaakov to leave Lavan? House? Anybody? When he's uh, been working on Wall Street for too long, when he made too much money and he forgot about his spiritual roots. See, when, before he goes, he's dreaming about ladders to the heaven. 
But at the end, he's dreaming about sheep and let's, how can I make my next billion dollars? Yeah, he's very rich. He's very successful. Just like the Jewish people left Egypt with lots of money, right? To go, so Yaakov, God says, you know what? Uh, not so good. Uh, he's going to be lost. He's going to get so, like Lot, like exactly Lot, our first sort of story of Egypt that we spoke about last year. Lot is Storm. Lot goes to Storm because it reminds him of Egypt. Lot is Lot to the Jewish people. He was too materialistic and he got lost. He's not part of us. So I, I keep hitting my video. I don't know what. Anyways, um, so um, so too. So God said, Yaakov, time to get out of here. What do our sages say? The Jewish people were on the 49th level of, of Tuma, of impurity. It's time to get out of Egypt. You got to go on the brink of assimilation. They're chased by Lavan. Lavan doesn't like. He's sneaking out at night, the Jewish people, you know, and uh, they, Lavan chases him. Paro. I leave, but I change his mind. He's going to chase after the Jewish people. And even after they leave, they have to, um, Yaakov has to um, confront Esav. He doesn't know. Thank God that goes a lot better than expected. And the Jewish people have to fight with Amalek. So um, when they leave, so I, I, it's like, it's unbelievable. The, it's the exact same story. And this, I did mention, I think last year, just this last part is that's why Yaakov Avinu was afraid to go to Egypt. See, or he, he realized like a, a light went off in his head because Yaakov Avinu thought this was the exile. God told Avram, you're going to be, a, um, you know, foreigners and, and strangers and slaves and persecuted. And the fourth generation is going to come back to Israel. So Yaakov Avinu thought, that's that's me. I just had that. I was persecuted. I was a slave, right? How, how long can this, can this, what's the maximum amount of years, quote unquote, a slave can work? Six years. How many years does Yaakov have to work? Seven years. Like Laban, you know, made him more than a slave, right? Whatever, seven and seven. But um, Yaakov Avinu says, this is it. I'm Im Laban Garti. David Silver in his Haggadah develops this theme, right? Gerud, Inui, and Abdu, those three terms, a stranger, a slave, and persecution exist by Yaakov, and of course exist in the Exodus story. So Yaakov Avinu thought, that's it. They're not going to be in exile to Egypt. And he's the, and his children are the fourth generation. There's Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and y Yaakov goes back with his children, right? Back to the land of, um, of Israel. So that's it. Uh, what about the 400 years? Also, it's going to be 400 years. It wasn't 400 years. Uh, the 400 men? <laughs> Wild Most, guess. No, so Meaning that know Yaakov, already, yeah. Yeah, what we're going to say? No, you said 400. So in the, the parallel to 400 is he was confronted by the 400 men. Oh, that's Asaph. also true. Correct. 400 men of Asaph. For sure, there's a link between the 400 years and the 400 men of Asaph. Absolutely. And the 400 uh, you know, shekel that Avram paid for Sarah to get Eretz Yisrael. For sure, they're linked, right? But um, what what? But knew he knew it wasn't four hundred years. So already, our sages say we weren't in Egypt four hundred years. Our sages say we were in Egypt for two hundred and ten years. So already, they 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 whittled it down. But I would say very simple that Yaakov Avinu, um, Yaakov Avinu thought God was being very nice, right? Chishev at It's not going to be four hundred years, and God will be nice, just like it's the opposite. I just realized this is such a power. I think it's very powerful. Yeah, God promises Yaakov when he's fleeing from Asa years earlier. So he has this dream and God comes to him and he's going to, you know, he's going to protect him. And then Yaakov said, if God will be with me, when I get back, I'll give charity. What do you mean if God? God just gave him a promise. What a chutzpah. God just promised Yaakov he's going to be with him. He's going to return him home. And Yaakov says, if God's with me, a chutzpah. So the Medra says, you know why? Oh, Shema Yigram up. God's promise is conditional. You have to, uh, maybe Yaakov will sin so much. Maybe he'll become so assimilated. Maybe he'll do all these terrible things. God won't keep his promise. God makes a covenant, but if we break our half of the bargain, that's what Yaakov, whether it's true or not, is irrelevant. But that's what Yaakov Avinu feared. So if Yaakov Avinu thought that God can sort of forestall the covenant because of his, neg his sins, so too, for, for good reasons, God can be very nice. And bring it earlier. So it's clear that Yaakov, the story of Egypt already took place with Yaakov. And of course, that's why the last piece of the puzzle, of course, is why is uh, where do the Jewish, where does Yaakov go after he meets Esav? Where does he go? Shechem. That's later. So let's take a look. I, I don't even know oh, if I... Sukkot. 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 Oh, no, Sukkot. Yeah, who said Levos, that? Sukkot Shalem was Shlema. 
Right, right. Yaakov went to Sukkot. Let me see. What verse is that? Chapter 33, I think. Let me just quickly go, because it's pretty powerful. Everybody see me scrolling here a little bit? I think it's... There, there's Shem. But before Shem... Ay, ay, ay. Uh, no, here it is. Okay. Um... I think it's the beginning. The Yaakov Nasa Sukkota went to Sukkot. By even though bite Ulumikneo Sukkot, right? A Sukkot is not fit for human habitation. That's for your cattle. Okay, Karash. Why is it called? It's even called Sukkot because he built a little hut there for his cattle. So Yaakov Avinu goes to Sukkot. New, where do the Jewish people go? The Jewish people go to by Yisubenes Romi Ramsay Sukkota. And of course, the fact that it's a different Sukkot is even more powerful. It's even more powerful that the, in other words, the fact that the Torah says they went to Sukkot and it's in Sukkot that they ate matzah. Right? And that's where they cooked the, 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 all the dough and they ate matzah in Sukkot. That's clearly another link in the story between Yaakov and Egypt. Uh, they both go to Sukkot. It's like they're so powerful. The Torah is basically telegraphing it you just have to read it, it carefully so that's the story of Yaakovin and that's of course why Lavan Lavan of course is Paro and that's exactly what the uh, I think what the Haggadah um, had in mind okay let's uh let's uh, we'll come back and say that maybe I don't think today okay so anything okay um Corbin has to be of Matzah now what about the fact that we all know, the fact that I'm, I'm forgetting that we all learned in, in kindergarten that uh, we we eat matzah because we left Egypt in a hurry. The Torah does say that. And the Torah in Parshat Re'e says, Ki the, the, the Torah on more than one occasion emphasizes the fact. Raman Gamliel, Ayomer, Matzal Shuma, Shum Shalom, we speak with Tetam. They didn't have time and except, you know, they had to leave in a hurry. So what's all that about? So I... That's also true. It's, it's not a contradiction to what we said before. They're both true, but I think it's something else. I think that's why we eat matzah on the first night of Pesach. We know in halach, and I think perhaps, maybe uh, you'll tell me if you think this is going too far, but perhaps this is the basis of the halacha that you only have to eat matzah on, at the Seder on the first night. Okay, we live out, those who live outside of Israel on the first two nights, but that's a rabbinically. You only have to eat matzah at the first night. Um, the rest of the week, you don't have to eat matzah. You can't eat chametz. So if you want to eat wheat, you got to make sure it's it's matzah, but you don't have to eat it. The first night is an obligation. So that could be because we left Egypt in a hurry. And then the seven days could be these other reasons that we gave, perhaps. But the Torah clearly separates the mitzvah teeth matzah and leaving in hurry and by the way if you look carefully let's take a careful look unless i'm totally mistaken if you go to chapter 12 where they actually leave in a hurry it says like this um by isu or uh, b'nei israel left okay by isu yes by some at betseko they took their um, their dough before it was leavened, right? They lemaher l'shokam. In the previous verse, they, they have to leave in a hurry. The Egyptians are throwing them out. Lemaher, get out of here because we're all going to die if you don't leave soon. So they took it. It wasn't turned in, in, into chametz yet. And then they, and like amazing. Then, oh, by the way, before we leave, can we have your gold and your silver? But we don't have time to discuss that now. Like, like right in the middle, all the Egyptians have died. All the firstborns are torn. They're throwing us out. Get out of here. You know what? Take our gold, take our silver, just get out of here, take whatever you want, right? And they gave it, yeah, all their gold. And then we went, and that's where we cooked our, our matzah. But notice the Torah never says that's why we eat matzah. This is where I would expect the Torah to say, um, eat matzah. That's not what it says. It just says we left after 430 days, years. And then it says it's the night God is going to protect you. There's no command to eat matzah. So even like, that's, uh, I think, an unbelievable thing. In other words, it's true, we left in a hurry, but the, tor the Torah, and there must be something wrong with my linkage here. The, the Torah never um, never links leaving Egypt in a hurry with eating matzah. We all link it, and Raman Gamliel links it. But if you look carefully in the Chumash, the command to give eat matzah is not written in the fact that we left Egypt in a hurry. So I think that's very... Jerry, just whatever. It's worthy of much consideration. Why does the Torah do that? Even if the Torah is foretelling the future, even if the really we eat it because we left in a hurry, why does the Torah write it the way it writes? And that's what I think perhaps that's the difference between eating matzah on the first day 
that's because we left Egypt in hurry at night, in the hurry. That's what God took us out at night, right? And uh, right, and um, and then the rest of the week we got to eat it for all these other reasons. Okay, let's spend a few minutes on Manishtana, and I think that'll be the last thing we'll talk about today. Uh, Manishtana. So uh, those who were at um, Rev. Ramon's wonderful shear on Sunday, I uh, heard him discuss that uh, you know the question why Manishtana. Why is there no answer? He claimed the answer is in Ravan Gamliel Omer, but away at the end of the Seder. One of the questions on Manishtana is we never directly answer the questions. Even if everyone is right, it's not so so um, clear. It's not uh, obvious that it's the answer. And the kid's not going to pick up on that, right? If this is a, a kid asking question, Manishtana. So why do we never answer the questions? Anybody have any ideas that would like to share? Why don't we answer the questions directly? So I'll say like this, I'll say like this. What does it mean to be free? Questions is the sign of a free person. Speech is a sign of a free person. Freedom of speech, every democracy, freedom of speech, right? That's what the dictators do. They take over, they control the media. We know, you know, God forbid, like people in Auschwitz, they couldn't talk. People who are have lots of burdens who are enslaved, People who have mental health issues are enslaved to themselves. They can't talk. That's a psychiatrist wants you to talk. Get get it get it out in the air. Get it out of you. Talking is a sign of freedom. The fact that you can talk. Even the word, I think it's so beautiful. I mentioned this in my class yesterday in chat, and so it's wow, that's amazing. I, the kids, the kids were like blown away by this. Pesach. What does Pesach mean in two words? Pesach. The mouth speaks. A sicha. The Pesach. The mouth talks. Right. Um, where is this sect? After we went to Sukkot, then we went to Etam Mikseyami Bar, and they went to Pi Hachirot. That's what Torah says. We went to right in the beginning of Bishal, the mouth of freedom, speaking. So freedom is all about the ability to speak, especially to ask questions, because questions is all about um challenge and freedom when you ask a question i don't have to tell you how many people were turned off to judaism because they would ask a hard question they said how do you say it in yiddish this the, the kashas i don't know how to say it uh, zev how, how do you say that in yiddish right uh um so uh we don't ask questions here right we know there was a certain style of judaism at a certain time we don't ask questions we just do and uh, that's not going to work here not going to work for most people <laughs> maybe for some it will work Questions means you challenge. That's why the people don't like questions. That's exactly what Pesach has to be. Pesach, we we don't we almost don't care what the answer is. We almost don't care what the answer is. And I'll show you a thing we've mentioned. I think people know, but let's see it inside. We don't even care what the question is, just as long as you ask questions. Where's that? So here, this uh, fame, this is right after the four questions are mentioned in the Mishnah. Amr Ali Rav Nachman Ladaro Abde. Rav Nachman said to his slave, his servant Daro. Abda the mafi claim a rate lecheru marre lecheru. A slave whose master frees him, but yav le kaspa vedava, and he gives him gold and silver. Ma buy le le mamer. What should he say to him? A marle. So the staro answered, buy le aduye vilef shuche. You have to give gratitude and praise to God. A marle petartam milomar manishtana. I don't have to say manishtana. We asked the question, he gave an answer. Let's move on. Petach mamar avadim hayinu. So even the questions don't really matter. It's all about the ability to ask questions. So Pesach is not the time for answers. Pesach is the time for questions. Ki yishalcha bincha la machar lemor. Ki yishalcha bachar mazot. Right? Who doesn't ask questions? The Russia. Vayakiyomru alechem b'neichem. When your child will say to you, maha avoda hazot lachem. The, the, if you look carefully in Torah, this part is not in the, the Haggadah, but in the precursor to the verse, it's ki yishalcha bincha vayakiyomru. And the saddest child, eno yodei elishol. That's what, what, how sad. Eno yodei elishol. So Pesach, we don't have to answer the questions, okay? that that's That's not what Pesach is about. So yes, we do here and there, or, or the, I would say, avadim hayinu is all you need. What, why, what is the answer to the question? We were slaves. As slaves, we couldn't ask questions. Now we're free. We can ask questions. That answers all the questions. The rest is all the details. Why is it matzah, mara, leaning, dipping? All right, that, that, that we'll do later. We'll, in the course, we'll figure it out. But the answer is, the basic answer is we were slaves. Slaves don't ask questions. God took us out. We're not slaves. We do give, uh, give questions. Now, when do we give the answers? 
When do we give the answers? On Sukkot. On Sukkot, right? Obviously. Now, this, uh, okay, let me explain. Uh, right, I know people, uh, I can see expression on some faces. What is this guy talking about? Okay, Sukkot, is this here? Basukot teshvu shivat yamim. Kol es rachav Yisrael. This is an Amor, the famous for all the holidays. Leman yedu. Ooh, we're no longer asking, we're giving knowledge. So that you should know. Kiba Sukkot. Remember, we went to Sukkot. It's not a coincidence we went to Sukkot right after Chag Pesach, right? The, 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 the question, the famous question of the tour, why don't we eat matzah in the sukkah? Why don't we have, have sukkahs in the spring? Because it's the same holiday. Pesach and sukkahs are flip sides of the same holiday. Pesach is the question. Sukkot is the answers. Leman yedu doratechem. Kiba Sukkot hoshap the Ibnei Israel b'hotziot tamir to Mitzrayim. You know why we sit in sukkah? Because God took us out of Egypt. I thought we ate matzah because God took us out of Egypt. Maybe, but we also sit in the sukkah because God took us out of Egypt. That's how the Torah presents it. They don't present this by matzah by Pesach. So that's and the man ye do. You have to know. And the tour, the first halacha in the tour is he paskins. When you sit in the sukkah. There's a debate. Do we actually have in sukkah or do we sit in Ananei HaKavod, clouds of glory? And the Torah Paskins, he rules that a Jew must sit in the sukkah because we had clouds of glory. And if you don't do that, you didn't properly fulfill the mitzvah. Who cares? What do you mean? You have to know why you're sitting in the in, in the sukkah. Why? Because the man ye do, Dora Techem. That's how the, the Bach explains on the tour right there at the beginning of Hilchot Sukkot, the Bait Chadash, who was uh, um, the 17th century Poland. So he explains that um, that um, because the Torah says, the you, do, you must know why you're seeing Sukkot. But I don't have to know why I'm eating matzah. Uh, the more even has discussion, they, they shove matzah down your throat. You don't even know where you're eating. You can fulfill the mitzvah. So Pesach is questions to quote his answers. And that's why the Gemara says there's what we call um, Agzei Shava. The Tetvav, Tetvav. They're both on the 15th of the month. They're on the two key months of the year that the, we revolve our whole calendar, Nisan and, and Tishrei, 15, 15. Because the Gemara is linking the laws <laughs> of Pesach. And to quote, you asked me, Zev, before we started, what's the earliest time we can start the, the, the Seder? So we know whatever, it's got to be at night. Same thing on, on Sukkot. You can't bring in Sukkot early. The only holiday you're allowed to bring in early, people don't do it, but you're not allowed to, is Shavuot. You're allowed to bring in early Shavuot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Okay. You're allowed to bring in early Shavuot, but Sukkot, why not? Because the same way I can't do it early on Pesach, I can't do it on Sukkot. I think it's a beautiful idea, and that's why the Jewish people travel from Ramses to Sukkot. So Sukkot is ki yishacha bincha, and Sukkot is Leman Yedu Dorotechem. And uh, of course, it's a year process where we're answering questions, so to speak, asking and answering questions um, all year. But that's really, I think, uh, a very beautiful idea. Okay, it's getting a little late. Um, all right, gentlemen. Yes. The Pesach you quoted there doesn't say that that uh, we, I took you out of uh, Egypt and you sat in the uh, Sukkot because I took you out of its tribe. It says, when I took you out of its tribe. So you have to know that God took us out um, through the... What we're remembering is that he protected us in the Midbar, not that the fact that he took us out of Egypt. He says, I protected you in the Midbar when I took you out of Egypt. It doesn't say because I took you out of Egypt. But it's clearly linked. I, I hear what you're saying. Lemanye du tortechem kibus basukot teshvu shivat yamim. Lemanye du tortechem kibus sukot hoshapti. How did I take you out of Egypt? It's part of the whole Exodus story. How, when did we eat matzah? We didn't eat matzah in Egypt. We ate matzah in Sukkot. We, that's what the Torah specifically says. They didn't have time. They baked it after they left Egypt. That's how I started the whole shir halach manya. There's no evidence. That, I mean, the, the Torah doesn't tell us they probably did eat matzah in, in Egypt, but it it doesn't matter. The Torah's presentation of matzah is after they left Egypt. They left in her. They ate matzah only in Sukkot. So matzah and Sukkot are clearly totally connected to each other. And I'll just say, just to finish this idea, we can continue. Basically, it takes time to find answers. Sukkot is 40 years. We sat in Sukkot for 40 years, right? <laughs> Pesach, we, 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 what's going on here? We, the, the, the Jews went to the desert. They didn't know what's going on. They didn't know what they're getting into. That's why they complained. They had a slave mentality. They weren't ready. They're at, it's, on the one hand, they're like kids. Wow, unbelievable. This, well, God, um, food from the sky and water from a rock. Wow, they're blown away. On the other hand, they're like, 
you know, what what are we doing? Are we nuts going into um, a, a desert? And it's lots of questions, amazement. Only 40 years later, when we, you know, do we begin to begin answers. When you're young, we have lots of questions in life. It takes 40 years to discover the answers. So Pesach is time to question. So what Panai, what we read on Cholamoid, with the reading of the Chet Egel, you cannot know my face. Moshe says, I want to know you. No, you cannot know me. You can only know me in the perspective of history. You can only see my back. You can only begin to understand many, many years later. So that's why Pesach, we don't know enough. We're, we're just starting our journey. Sukkot, uh, the journey is coming to an end. It's we're coming to the land of Israel. And that could be now why we tell the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim from the perspective of the farmer, right? If we're telling the Haggadah, we have to tell the story. See poor Yitzhak Mitzrayim. We have to tell the story of the Exodus. So how are we going to tell the story? I'm going to open up the book of Shemot and I'm going to start to read. I, I don't know. I'm going to read Shemot. For okay, you have to figure out where you're going to read. The beginning of the Te'eser, who cares? Uh, chapter 12. I'm going to open up Sefer Shemot. That's the story. That's not what we do. We have the farmer bringing his first fruits on Shavuot or after Shavuot, Bikurim. And the farmer, when he's bringing his first fruits, also has to give us a synopsis of, of Jewish history. Why do we do that? Why not tell the story from where it actually happened? Because that's the point. Yeah. It happened where two historians never comment they they have to wait uh, no historian is going to write about the events going on in israel now in a, in a in a generation historians will write about what the impact was historians need you need the perspective of time to understand so at pesach we have the questions when we where we today sit at our seder we have to tell the story enough it's true we have to feel as if we left egypt we also have to we have the maturity we have all this history coming so we have to tell the story from the perspective of the farmer who's now a thousand years later he's now oh now i get it now egypt was a place where they enslaved people bad sexual ethics don't follow the egyptian sexual ethics bad business ethics have honest weights because i took you out of egypt all these things don't follow egypt ah oh, we have to create our own society we have to see the wonders of egypt the beauty of egypt we have to learn the good from egypt we have to see the terrible thing. oh now now i get it now we i understand why i had to spend 210 years but that's the farmer a thousand years later living in the land of israel so that's why we don't tell the story from the story we tell the story from a much later point in history Okay, I feel free in a second to ask questions to challenge everything I said. I'll just do a, a quick review like I always like to do. And please, God, we will continue those I, who can come on, uh, on Wednesday morning. What else is there better to do than learn some more Torah on Wednesday morning? I, I appreciate it. People are busy. You can burn the chametz while you're on computer or eat your last bagel yeah. if you'd like. But uh, like I said last night, I wouldn't have the chutzpah to ask anybody else to give a shear on Wednesday morning, but I can ask myself to give such a, a shear. Hold, hold, hold on. I, I just want to do a, a quick review and then I'll take a, a question. So we've gone with um, Halach Mania, the Torah, we ate the Achlu Avatad Mitzvah, that we ate in Egypt. We never, the Torah at least never presents that we ate matzah in Egypt, although it makes sense why matzah is a slave food. We ate matzah when we went out of Egypt, not in Egypt. When we left Egypt, in Sukkot, we ate matzah. And then we discussed, but the command to give matzah was given two weeks earlier. We know it's written totally independent of the, the fact that we left early. The fact that we left early that the Torah does talk about doesn't say eat matzah, just gives a historical fact that we left early, but it doesn't link it to the command. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike the idea that a non-Jew can't eat, that is linked. The Torah says, oh, a bunch of non-Jews came with us, Arab Rav. Oh, they can't eat from the Korban Pesach. That the Torah does think, but it doesn't do it by matzah. Meaning the main purpose of matzah is independent of leaving in a hurry. And we gave basically three basic ideas. Egypt is a bread bread basket of the world they wouldn't eat bread with the hebrews it's terrible the idea of um of sensitivity to the poor it is a poor um person's uh food we have to be sensitive to the poor so at our fanciest meal of the year we just <sighs> wafers to know just like we fast on yom kippur to know what it's like to be um to be be hungry and uh we said that also it's the first korban it's the first Korban coming close to God. Pesach is the time we became close to God. We formed as a nation. And just like in a Korban, you can't have chametz. Mm -hmm. So too uh, for the Korban Pesach, which every Korban was eaten with wine and bread and matzah. So too, the Korban Pesach is eaten with bread. Of course, wine is a, a rabbinic mitzvah, but nonetheless, it works out very um, beautifully. And we said why the Korban can't be made of chametz. Simplicity, whether that's emuna pshuta, simple, humble faith, to be humble, it's not the arrogance of bread, and the idea of acting quickly. We Jews 
can't relax too much. Maybe go to Club Med once uh, once in a lifetime. I don't know. But uh, what, what, whatever it is, you got to ask Yaakov. God didn't like Yaakov. <laughs> they rest too much. Uh, and uh, that's a Jew always has to be on the move. And then we said possibly, um, but the Torah does say we left in a hurry. So that might explain why the first night there's an obligation to eat matzah. The rest of the week, shivatimi matzot tochelu, even though it sounds like an obligation, just like basukot teshu shivatimi. Again, here's another comparison. You don't have to sit in the sukkah all week. Just if you eat a meal, you can't eat it outside the sukkah. Only the first night you're obligated. Even though the, the sound of the Torah, sounds like it's obligated. The halakha doesn't see that as an obligation. It sees that as optional. We discussed recently, I think, the Gra says it's an optional mitzvah, but we're not going to go into that now, now. That if you eat it, you get a mitzvah, but you don't have to eat it. Okay, that's for another discussion. And then we discussed the, the, the Manishtana, and the whole point is to talk. Free people talk. Abedim Hayinu, we can't talk. We can't ask. That's even a greater challenge. That's a great idea of, of, of freedom. You can ask questions. You can challenge. That's wonderful. And the answer is, Abedim Hayinu, we couldn't talk. Now we're free. We can talk. The details aren't important. You can ask whatever question you want. Almost give whatever answers. We'll give answers later. It doesn't really suck. The mouth has to talk. We go to pi hachirot. We go to the mouth of of, of of freedom and then we said uh we did all the comparisons between yaakov and the story of yaakov and um egypt is one and the same what happened to yaakov just totally the same story happens to b'nai israel his descendants including ending off in sukkot that's where he matzah and the comparison so pesach is about asking questions sukkot is the time we can appreciate the questions on the problems that we had okay thank you very much let me go through the chat box if anybody has any question happy to answer uh, doesn't the phrase "this is the bread of affliction" describe that I was eaten? Yes, it. I, I'm assuming they did eat it. Matzah is good food to give uh -huh. states for sure. But all I'm pointing out is the fact. It's always important to know what the Torah says, right? The fact that Avram was thrown into uh, the, the the burning furnace, or a, a lot of things that may be important, are not mentioned in the Torah. That doesn't mean they're not true. It just means, I mean. The Ramban actually wonders if that is true, that it was thrown into to a furnace, but I don't really care. The idea, it's important to know what's in Rashi. That's a, that's a problem we have today. We we mingle together. Like, you know, there was Chlomish before Rashi. There was Chlomish before Midrashim. And uh, even as Midrashim may be even more important than what's in the Chlomish, perhaps for sure, hal, 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 but it's very important to know what's in the text and what's not in the in in the in the text. So the Torah never describes them eating matzah. The Torah wants to describe Egypt, fish and cucumbers. We're going to go back. We left a land of plenty to go to a land where we're totally dependent on God, where we need rain. In Egypt, everything flows because of the Nile. Okay, repetition is a form of remembrance of important discourse. Yeah, you have to repeat. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Club Med was initially created post the Holocaust. Really? Really? Wow, I did not know that. Where did Dr. Lakshin gave a shear on Wednesday? You can look on our website, everything. If you're not on our email list, I don't know how we get here if you're not on our email list, but make sure you get an email list and we send out. But it's, I believe it's already posted. If you go to our Pesach page, go to the website or go to our Tim Tora page, you can see Dr. Lakshin. He was speaking about the meaning of RMA OV, Oved. Okay. I believe in Torah. Okay. Pro I don't know what that means. Probably with Tim, there's a whole Passover series. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're answering that. Okay. Here's the link to David Singer's article. Oh, thank you very much, David. Right. They are in a club and very good. Okay. Thank you. And no oh, 1985. Okay. 37 years ago. You're right. Okay. In Kiddush for Shabbos, we mentioned. Yetzir Mitzrayim. Yeah, Shabbos is our vacation. That's true, right. Shabbos is, there is, we need Menucha. There is Shabbat Menucha. But obviously, and depending who you are, but obviously it's the vacation. Yaakov, in other words, he wanted to retire. No, no. You can retire on Shabbos. You can't lay shape a for the rest of your life. As long as God's, you, God has given you life on this earth, you have to do the best you can. Okay, whatever you can. So, yes, the four kashas. That's Yiddish. Okay. It seems in ancient Hebrew, Ma also means ex- Proof, wonder. Oh yeah. Ma, wow. Okay. Ma. Wow. Okay. You're saying ma. Okay. Very good. That's the question. Does ma, ma, ma mean why or what? Is there really one question? Maybe it's one okay. question and then more answers. Well, how is this night different? I'll tell you. Okay. I mean, it's a matzo. So then yeah. that is the answer. It's one question. Manishtana. So that's a whole other discussion. How what the manishtana? But that's not the way our tradition has understood it. We've understood it. The man, wow. You're right. Manishtana. How different? And then we ask, why this? Why that? Why that? The manishtana is like an introduction, kind of like Anochi had he brought. That's like an introduction. 
Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Rabbi Zak points out that the Torah only begins to use the word Korban and Vayikra. After Mishkan, we learn how to come close to God. Before it's referred to as a Zevach. Okay. And Rabbi Schwartz. Oh, by the way, Rabbi, well, those were at the Shir last night when Rabbi Schwartz had a technical. Finally, this morning, I got in contact with him. He emailed me. Email went out on this whole block for hours last night. He could not get on. He had no way to contact, but he's going to. Um, he, want, he asked me, he would like to tape the last like 15, 20 minutes of the shear. There was a, a dark glitch and we, we will we will post it. But um, Rabbi Schwartz, the part he gave, was talking about without uh, without ethics, of course, you can't have korban. Um, from we know the emphasis on the korban until Christianity. Okay, no, I think the emphasis is on the korban until we lost the Beit Hamidash, right? Fregnish Kane Kashes, right? No, Freik, you have it, that's what I'm saying? Okay. Um, Okay. Is, okay. okay. No, thank you. Okay. Any Brexit cashes, whatever. I don't know Yiddish. My father used to yell at me all the time. What kind of a house did I grow up that I don't know Yiddish? But uh my my father, Allah Shalom, used to teach Yiddish to, to my grandmother because uh my grandmother knew English. My grandmother lived in New York, so I didn't see her, you know, saw her a few times a year. My maternal grandparents came here. My my grandmother came at the age of one. My grandfather is a, a, a teenager. My mother didn't know any Yiddish till she married my father. So the only time my parents spoke Yiddish is if they didn't want us to understand something. And there wasn't, I guess it didn't happen enough. So I never picked up any Yiddish. And I missed out on so many jokes. But no, no, what can you do? All right. All right. Any questions or comments or uh what time Wednesday morning? I'm sorry. What time Wednesday morning? 30. We'll do our regular time. Is that I think that's the best time. That's what we we'll do. See, it's after shul. It's after if you're a bachor, it's after the seum, after you've eaten another bagel, after you I'm worried about the chamates, after you've sold the chamates, plenty of time. Now it's time to relax, to learn, prepare, and hopefully well after a cleaning has happened. Yeah, so but but 9 30 for you is before shul for me. Oh, before okay even better <laughs> then i don't get to but, no no time. believe me anybody who comes it's wonderful i just whatever i i like the idea of torah you know every day as much as we can do and best up so uh like i say I, i'm not asking anybody else to give the shear but uh i'm happy to give the shear and whoever comes bar, bar hashem will will come and whoever can't come i fully understand i i appreciate anybody who comes any week i think it's wonderful people want to come to learn torah it's beautiful this gives me so much strength and all the shear we have it's uh Thank God, I feel blessed to be able to, for me to personally teach and for me to um, arrange for other people to teach. I think uh, I'm very lucky and I have a, a lot of hakar satov to hakarash barku, to my parents, to, you know, for all of this. Anyway, Zev, yeah, what do you want to ask? Your hand is up, I think. No, that's that's the Yashikoya. Oh, that's a Yashikoa. Okay. All right, everybody. I have, I have I have a couple questions. Sure. I sure. have a question. Okay. Too. One at a time. Let's go. I'm happy to stay on to answer all the questions. All right. You, you mentioned Shabbat Shalom. Okay. Two two things. You mentioned about Lot in Egypt. I don't recall Lot being in Egypt. No, no, he went with Ephraim when the famine, of course. They went to Egypt right right at the beginning in chapter. And it 12. says explicitly they went together. Of course, and then it comes back, and that's the Chamalibus. That's one of the first things. Okay, then no, no, no. no. no when say, they go I, down, I it's Abraham, Sarah, and Lot, and their money. When they come back, it's Abraham, Sarah, their money, and Lot. The materialism had split Abraham and Lot from each other. Uh, and he uh, says in front of Lot, I, now I know how beautiful you are. It's about to his wife. However, I don't know if Lot was in the backseat of the car. I don't know exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. All right, and then yeah. you mentioned about four days for the korbanot yeah so you're saying i had to be in jerusalem for the korban pesach i don't know if you had days? to be somebody it had to be taken four days in advance no you probably bought it from a merchant who had it. that's an actually an interesting point but that's why we say you know you know slichus a minimum of 40 days we're like a a, a korban the idea that a korban had to be watched for four days so i didn't so i, I didn't don't think you had to watch it. somebody else somebody else you i assume you would buy the the merchants in jerusalem i mean you know yontif in the time of the mishnah was very different people used to slaughter animals like in the morning on the way to the base of Mita. they used to buy animals slaughter them cook them i mean you read the mishnah, the mishnah wait, wait a minute but you're saying like you're yontif. saying that's for maybe a chatat or whatever but if it's Bikurim, didn't I bring the Bikurim animals also with me? No, could, Bikurim that couldn't is only be fruit. substituted. Bikurim is only fruit. There are no animals with the Bikurim. 
I thought that the, that the the first animals of everything I had were also Hashem's. That's a different mitzvah. That's a, a bechor. But that, the, but every, those yes, but the bechor, right? So yeah, things had to be watched. I don't know all the technical details, of everything, but the basic halacha was yes, you had to watch it for four days before you brought it on the mizbeach to make sure there weren't any any defects in the animal. So that's a a, a technical issue. We obviously haven't you know you know dealt with in two thousand years. Right, so, so 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 the story about the Roman uh, uh, korban that where they cut the, so it had four days to heal. I, yeah, so I assume that can't heal, it won't heal, or certain things. That's yeah, something's healed. So there's a whole mess in in Shas, There's all Mishnahs talk about that. I believe there are ninety two mumim of an animal. If I'm not mistaken, the Mishnah lists off. I have to check the mumim, and then some are permanent, and they have a mum that come that it repairs itself. Correct. You have all the stuff. I think it's not really so relevant now but yeah when we learn coaching we can go into all all all, all the okay thank you okay and it's well, so a question yes um by the way a wonderful here is always thank you um when we were talking um, the the question they came up the other up after Rabbi Rocky Sheeran went there. When, when, when he talked about the whole Indian, I mean, you, you gotta go from, from shame to. Right, right. Shame. From Machil Begnudim Asayim B'Shevach, Dr. Yeah. Lakshin gave a very uh, original, I guess, uh, interpretation that that's the, the Gnud is Arami Ove Ravi and the Shevach is. Uh, uh, what what okay, run the makom. It's that that's the gnut is uh is the story of the um of a uh, rami and why is it a gnut? So we quoted Rashi saying that um that Lavan, the fact that Lavan's our forefather, because most of us are descendant from Rachel, those who aren't from Bilha Zilpa, most of us are descendant from we assume Rachel and Leah, Sheva Jehuda, you know, it's most of us we think. Um, so um we're descendants of Lavan. So Lavan's one of our fathers. So that's what Rashi says. The, yeah. says the Gnut is that really the we have a, a Shmendrick like Lavan as our uh, great grandfather. But but there was something else he mentioned. He mentioned passing. Okay, he 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 he, he said that you know we came we were I don't want to in anything in that one we went down to Egypt and we were slaves. And I'm and I'm wondering is the fact that we were slaves is something that we should be ashamed about. Oh, that's and a great we, question. I so mean that that's a great question. We assume and, right and, not the glute that and, and make I was looking in the davening today, okay? And when we say at the beginning of the davening, we, we say... Hello, Sani Aved. No, we say, well, yeah, on the, you know, it's a mind that we, we say, and we, and we say, Ma'an, Ma'chayinu. Ma'chayinu, right? Say, it's okay. But, right. but but the, then we get it. yeah, it's okay to be a slave to God, not to man. That's it. Um, I mean, I think but, what you're asking is a great but, question. What's the shame in being a slave? But uh, right, the, but I think it's it's still, first of all, it may be what people think, but it's also there's a difference between slavery to Paro and and servitude to, to God or not servitude, but, serving God, serving God. But, but right, right. what's the shame that we were slaves? It was good for us, right? We shouldn't be embarrassed. I think the fact that we're not really, in other words, the fact that we dwell on it, we, we that's part of the story. And the canoe, it's it's not good, it's not pleasant, but I think that we are. We, we're saying we're not really ashamed of it. It's the negative. We, okay. we tell us the, what other religion tells their stories about our ancestors were idol worshippers. We were slaves. That's not the way people people like to erase the parts of history they well, don't make. I think well, that's the beauty in Judaism. But can I make the because in the in the in the in the thriller we that I talked about 
it's okay when we say in the beginning, but then we say, Malkochenum, Malkochenum. Right. That, right. That, in the, in the fact that we don't have cola, the, the fact that they when I keep bullying, I don't think somehow this uh, I don't think this is talking about slavery at all. This is just no, in, it, it, it's talking about uh, accepting it. It says in my sitter, Kabbalah Roma Huchamaim, actually, right in before Lola Miedam, right at the beginning of the doubling. That the, we're accepting God. We're saying we're nobodies, right? Who are we? What's our strength? What's our the, nothing, right? This is where we degrade man a, a little bit. Everything before you, we, before you were like nothing. But I don't think that's due with slavery. But if I let, maybe Marty, I'm happy to talk afterwards. Maybe, maybe let's give a couple other people a chance if they have um, questions. But thank you. But you're, I think it's a great point you're making. It's it's not it's not uh, it's not embarrassed that we're slaves. We we dwell upon it. At the Seder, and we're not embarrassed that our ancestors worship idol worshippers, and that uh, we're not embarrassed by any of this. Yes, Annie, I think you have your question, your hand up. Yes, so I'm thinking about the idea of leaving in a hurry and not baking bread and that whole theory. But the night before, they're busy eating the Korban Pesach, they're painting the blood on the doorpost, they're making matzah for the meal they're having with the Korban Pesach, right? So they're not baking new bread and they're taking all their foils with them in the morning. So they're taking the rest of the matzah that they had the night before. So obviously it is related to leaving in a hurry, but they already have the matzah that they baked for the Right, the although it says in the Torah, they didn't have a chance to, to, to bake it. The, the Torah says they took out, out the dough. They didn't have a chance. Could be they thought they left before they thought they were leaving, right? The, the psukim are really not so easy to understand. Like, like what exactly happened in practice? Not to mention the problem I just sort of alluded to. I didn't discuss, did we leave at night or in the day? And various verses in the Torah seem to contradict each other. So it was probably... Um, a process. Maybe our, our freedom happened at night until we left was the daytime, but it's the way the Torah presents it. They actually made the matzah after they left Egypt. Right, that's the question. So what did they do the night before and why didn't it turn in, into chametz? I mean, all night, if the dough is there, maybe they hadn't put any water in it yet. I don't exactly know what they were baking. And uh, as I always say, these questions don't interest me personally that much. I, I think what's happening is the Torah does want to describe the eight matzah that we left in a hurry, but we waited in Sukkot. Um, but the Torah presents the, the um, for generations, the eight matzah not there. That's not where the Torah presents the obligation to eat matzah, presents the obligation to matzah much earlier, two weeks earlier, independent of leaving in a hurry. Later on, the Torah picks up on the theme, on, on chipazon. That, that becomes a later theme, and that becomes a theme at the Seder, in Rabban Gamliel. But I think it's important to note that chametz and matzah are unrelated, that the korbanot, they're totally unrelated to leaving Egypt. That's the point I'm trying to make, that I think is correct, but... Okay, any other questions? I don't want to keep people, I mean, I, you know, appreciate anybody's state, but uh, I'm happy to answer any other questions quickly and then we'll call it a, a morning, okay? I, I have a lot to do to prepare me for Pesach, to, you know, but on the Friday, you know, not on Wednesday, I hope. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, thank you very much. Everybody have a wonderful Shabbat. By the way, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock we start on Sunday, this year before Rabbi uh, Liebtag and... Um, on Hallel, on Hallel night, that's 10 o'clock, followed by Rabbi Leap Tag at 11.15, Monday uh, Monday at 11, Tuesday at 11, and Wednesday at 9.30. So we have Shirm um, every day, please God, through, through, through Pesach, and uh, look forward to learning with you. And like I say, invite a friend. If, if friends have nothing else to do next week, invite them to come to a Shir here. Is that 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock yeah. Eastern, yeah. All times I say, I know it's, um, I, we put on the email the Israeli time too, but yeah, Eastern. No, but is that no, everything everything is in English. Everything's in English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, Rav Rimon Shir was the only Shir we had in Hebrew. Everything else is going to be in English. Okay. All right. Um, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Thank you very Shabbat much. Shalom. Bye -bye. Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Okay. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom and thank you. Okay, thank you. Shabbat Shalom.